I knew that. Um, welcome to this meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee on the 23rd of January 2024. Just to remind members that this meeting is being recorded and will be available to view on YouTube. Um, item one is apologies. Uh, I've had apologies from Councillor Jason Jones. Are there any other apologies that we know of? Thank you. That is noted. Um, item two is minutes. The minutes of the previous meeting held on 28th November 2024 are here for, appro for approval. Is everybody content with them? So who's prepared to move? Thank you. Second. Thank you very much. All those in favour? Thank you. Moving on then to item three, declarations of interest. Um, please can I ask whether there are any interests to be declared? Yeah. Yep, thank you. Uh, I've been advised that now that I'm leader of the of Tamborough Council, I need to um, declare an interest. Um, so I'm the County Council rep, so I'll stay for that bit and then I'll leave you to the scrutiny. Um, and I've put in a request to be removed from that committee on council as well to not have any grey areas in the future. That's helpful. Thank you, Councillor Jay. Um, update from me. Um, we were um, expecting an update on the sheltered housing item. However, there's been a bit of a delay in the process, as I understand it. And this is now scheduled to come into the committee um, on the meeting on the 26th of March. However, there are certain deadlines that intervene which means that um, I may be asking the committee to put in an extra meeting on the 4th of March in order to consider this item. If we leave it till the 26th, we will miss our opportunity to comment. So is everybody content with that, that we hold an additional meeting on the 4th of March to consider this extremely important item? Can I have someone prepared to move that? Thank you. And to second? Thank you, Councillor Maycock. All those comment on that. Yep, well. of course. Personally, I think it's better coming in in the March, moving uh, moving forward, uh, because obviously, as part of the homelessness strategy on there, it takes into account the cold weather uh, protocol, and obviously now we see that there are some colder months in January and February, so I think that it, it, moving forward, generally, it's better to be in in a layer. Ignore that. Right, is everybody content with that, that we hold this additional March to consider this very additional meeting on the 4th of March to consider this extremely important item? Right, uh, moving on. Responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee. There are none at this stage. Item six, consideration of matters referred to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. Once again, there are none at this stage. Update on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. As I understand it, the most recent digest has been shared as part of the agenda pack. Um, are there any updates um, to share from County? Councillor Jay. Yep, yeah, hello. Um, so the two key items at the last meeting. Um, the first one was on maternity and neonatal services and the second was, was on the ICB performance and finance overview. So I'll give you a couple of highlights from there. Um, the, let me find it here. So there's now a patient safety specialist officer in place, which was a recommendation from the Ockenden report. Um, Fortunately, Staffordshire and Stoke on Trent has the highest, second highest neonatal mortality rate in the UK. Um, an improvement group has been established to better understand the data and identify areas for learning. Um, the Children and Young People Programme Board has been commissioned. Um, they've commissioned an infant mortality review um, to look at the the wider social factors which may impact on that rate. Um, a full root cause analysis is, is completed for every neonatal death. Um, there was a CQ 
QC visit um, to University Hospitals North Midlands Maternity Service in March 23, um, where a Section 29A notice was issued with further actions included in the final report. Um, the committee, the Staffordshire Committee, discussed whether there should be um, an independent sort of external audit of the actions off the back of that. Um, the next item was the ICB performance and finance overview. Um, basically, there's still a backlog in CAMS, so mental health uh, services. There's also a deficit of 66.4 million in the six months. Um, and they're looking at efficiencies, which they believe can bring in 75 million to bring it back on track. Um, and that was it. Two key items. And it's just really a quest for this committee. Is there anything you want me to take back? to the meeting next week. Colleagues, anything for Councillor Jay? Thank you. Um, just on the neonatal services, um, this seems to be going on for quite a long time. I wondered if there were any deadlines in place to, to try and see an improvement, if they'd set something up. You know, it doesn't, that doesn't come across here. Yes, I understand there are there are deadlines against actions, um, but I think if we go back to the let me see if I can find it here, it's mentioned in the minutes that until they achieve uh, close off the actions, no, um, what is it? Certain types of births aren't happening there, which obviously isn't great because people have to go elsewhere. Yeah, that's it. Um, and one of the key areas in there that's an issue is is uh, is staffing, recruiting, particularly after the pandemic, it's got worse. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for that report, um, particularly the neonatal item that can't be very easy to sit through. So we really appreciate you taking time to give us a digest as well as making sure we get these minutes. Thank you. Um, my question to go back was if there's any more information on staffing, um, any procedures that worked previously, any steps they're hoping to take so that the staffing issue can be addressed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So if I just find it here, they, they have had success in staffing recently. Uh, it's referred to here. Give me one second. Uh, yeah, so they just said here that there's been a, a recent successful recruitment campaign in both the University Hospital North Midlands and Derby and Burton, and that has reduced the vacancy rate. Um, the issue there with new people is that the influx of new people means more training, and the people are taken off the job, so you actually get worse performance for a period of time. But they feel at the moment um, that they're kind of where they need to, to be. There's some vacancies, but not like a critical amount. Councillor Clare. Yeah, just one concern there. Um, was it the backlog in the CAMS referrals that you were talking about? Yeah. And um, was that also the item where you mentioned um, they think there can be efficiencies that will try to eliminate some of that? The efficiencies run um, cost, so the, because of inflation, there's a 66.4 million deficit which they're trying to bring back in because of uh, inflation. Yeah. So the 66.4 deficit is in what area? Is That's it the integrated well, care board overall, rather right, than just okay. mental health. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I am concerned about the um, the CAMS backlog. Um, I have a a family that contact me quite often and. It's a minefield to actually get through. Um, and it only causes extra stress on these people. So I think it's something that maybe committee could have somebody come in and talk to us about CAMS, if that's possible. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, it, 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 sitting, sitting through the meetings and looking at the dashboards, etc., and as, you know, we've all got families and children and elderly parents, etc., you know, it is concerning. There's, obviously, you've got rag stasis, red, amber, green. That There's very little green on there. Um, so there are some successes. They're saying we now have, please don't quote me on this because I can't remember the exact amount, but I think they have a, I can't remember if it's 60 weeks or something. There's like a, um, a criteria to not have anyone over X weeks waiting for a procedure. But it, it yeah, 66 weeks. That, I mean, that is a long, long time to be waiting. Um, so, but then they're bringing that down, and then they'll look at the next category and try and bring it down. But at the moment, um, that's that's a long time for someone to have to wait. So it is concerning when you look at it all. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I've got a couple. Are there any other questions? No, um, just uh, something from me. Um, is there a recovery plan in place, both for maternity and neonates and for CAMs? Or are they, I mean, what have the CQC said in terms of recovery? So that's what was in the report, and that's what the, they went through, the actions they're, they're taking. Um, mainly, every meeting I've been to, it's, it was staffing, mainly. Uh, obviously, there were failings in the services which they've had to take actions on, but a lot of it is staffing, short, short staff. So the fact they've had successes um, should mean that they start to achieve some of those actions, close off some of those actions. I mean, I think we should be concerned as a committee that they have vacancies, significant number of vacancies, and they're still running at a 66 million deficit. What would the deficit be if they did not have those vacancies? And I think that's, for me, in terms of looking at a recovery plan for in both of those areas, I think that's a huge challenge. And I think you're right, Councillor Claymore, she gets somebody in to, to explain the implications for people in Tamworth and surrounding areas. I think that's right. Would that be reasonable, Councillor Jay? Yeah, I think so. Um, regarding the deficit point, um, this, this didn't come from them in the meeting, but it's come from meetings I've had often. The, the point on the budget is that by not having the staff in, it costs more to get people in on the bank and on overtime, etc., than to have a member staff in. So um, it it's self-perpetuates the, the budgetary pressure. Yes, agency costs are significantly higher than, than full-time staff. I understand that. But it would still be, I think, quite helpful to get somebody in to, to give us some clarity about what arrangements are being put in place. Councillor Dean. Thank you, Chair. Um, it just seems a bit of a conflict, the two things, in that we're saying there may have been some issues because of the staff weren't there, and now we're looking at efficiencies and efficiencies mean less staff. In some shape or form, that will be one of the outcomes. So that, that just seems contrary. You know, it, either it was failing because we hadn't got enough staff or, you know, just um, want to put that out there. Thank you. Did we get a breakdown of what the 75 million pound efficiencies would consist of? I was about to come back on that, so um, they didn't go into the detail on that, but they will be coming back again. So my assumption is they'll get into more detail each time, but they didn't go into the detail of uh, each efficiency, now. Thank you. Any other, any other questions on that one? Anything else you want to say in conclusion, Councillor Chair? Um, no, just to say um, I'll, I'll leave at this point to leave you to the scrutiny meeting. I'll, uh, I'll make a request to see who can come and talk about CAMS. I'm presuming you want me to do that as the county rep. Um, I'll copy you in. Yeah? Okay. That would be excellent. Can I, can I thank you for coming in and giving us such an honest and, and comprehensive update? Thank you very much. Right, moving on to um, item eight. And this is the disabled adaptations policy. Uh, this is to introduce the report of the portfolio holder for housing and planning for committee to review and consider the proposed draft housing assistance policy for the delivery of the mandatory um, DFG grant prior to submission to the cabinet for full approval and adoption. Would you like to, uh, to introduce it, Councillor Smith? Yep, thank you, Chair. So, um, yeah, before I hand over to um, the, uh, the assistant director, Paul Weston, um, so we're basically here to iron out the um, housing assistance policy. Um, essentially, we are currently running from essentially an act from 1996. Um, so this report takes the most up-to-date regulatory reforms that we have at our disposal as, a, as an authority. Um, <clears throat> we don't have... So we don't have a housing assistance policy, but we obviously need one. And that's in order to deliver the disabled facilities grants. Um, so all I'd say to this is, um, you know, disabled people are obviously some of the most vulnerable in society. So I'd, I'd support the maximum resources available 
Um, that would mean that I'm not in favour of the limited monetary only um, grant. So I'm not for the limited monetary options. Instead, I would suggest the full availability um, of support and maximum allowance through the top up grants. Thank you. Mr. Weston, do you want to, uh, to add? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, so sort of following on from that, uh, yeah, in the absence of a sort of stated housing assistance policy as set out here, we have been delivering grants just through the purely mandatory grant process, which effectively is under the uh, Housing Grants uh, Act. So that caps grants at £30,000. It doesn't give us any options for discretionary grants uh, or options around alternatives to providing grants. So it's purely been, you know, person makes a grant application, follows through the statutory process and either is awarded a grant or not based on that statutory process. What this does is it takes that it recognises that we do only have a very limited budget that comes through from central government uh, for disabled adaptations that comes via the Better Care Fund through county. Uh, there is no new money attached to this. It is purely within the existing budgets that we're relying on. Uh, but it does recognise the fact that the maximum grant available under the, under the Act is £30,000, which effectively doesn't go very far these days uh, and hasn't really been catching up with the the changes in sort of construction costs over a good many years now i think it's been quite a while it's been set at thirty thousand. so one of the recommendations in there is around a top-up grant which even at twenty five thousand on some of the larger schemes would probably push push our ability to deliver the works i think it's worth recognizing that because it still has has to be done within that sort of confined budget of what we get through the Better Care Fund, what it does mean is that potentially by issuing top-up grants, you reduce the overall number of grants you issue in total. Uh, so I think that, that needs to be recognised in there. Uh, the other one that's in there is the Professional Fees Grant. And again, at the moment, where someone actually goes through to a full application and, give, and is given a grant for works, any fees in that come, come out of that grant. What we do find is that some uh, projects don't progress to a full grant for various reasons, and you know that could, that could be a multitude of reasons. And again, this sort of really, I suppose, puts provision in there for us to be able to fund those through that grant process, rather than sort of having to seek other funding mechanisms or seeking the client themselves having to make a contribution towards those fees. And then the sort of final one on there is the uh, help to move grant which again, I suspect probably won't have a significant take up, if I'm being brutally honest, based on sort of conversation we've had in the past with people. But what it does do is it allows people to consider alternatives to having the existing home adapted, particularly if the home that they're living in isn't really suitable for adaption. And we do find that sometimes with, with property where actually it doesn't matter what you try and do with it, it would never really suit that person's need. Well, what this allows you to do is actually put that towards the cost of moving to an alternative uh, alternative property and providing ongoing support in terms of how, how they would go through that move. Uh, I think you know the policy sets out all of those. We've still kept in their uh, means testing of grants, so we haven't removed anything around means testing of grants. The passporting of grants doesn't change the result of this policy. That's still sort of at the statutory levels. Uh, eligibility remains as per the statutory grants uh, side of things. Uh, we haven't changed any of the timings around sort of the processes, so that's all within the, ma the mandatory grant process. Uh, and like I say, re really it is around those additional uh, top-ups uh, and alternatives, and it just formalises, I suppose, the, the, the statutory process and captures it in our own a policy document that sets it out sort of hopefully in a, a clear manner that people can follow through uh, and work through sort of uh, you know and understand their eligibility criteria and what they may be eligible for and what they may not be eligible for uh, also worth pointing out at this stage this is purely for grants it doesn't affect council tenants that's a different process however the, the basic, I suppose, flow through of work 
is largely the same for council tenants, but clearly with council tenants, there are no things like means testing or anything like that because they are properties, uh, so they don't have an asset, if you like. They, they don't they don't own a home uh, to, to be considered in that, so that, that's a different policy, and that will that will most likely sit as an addendum to our housing repairs policy uh, as opposed to, to this because it is a separate process. But broadly speaking, <laughs> the underlying criteria in terms of the assessment process and eligibility criteria remains the same. It's mainly the financials that are different because of the different tenure types. Uh, this does, however, apply to rented tenants in private sector renting and social housing providers, but not council. For, for whatever reason, that's the way the legislation is written. Uh, we've questioned it before, but that's the way the legislation It's very clear. It applies to all tenure apart from council housing tenants because there is an expectation that council will fund uh, adaptations for tenants through the housing revenue account. So it's just, just for clarity on that purpose. So happy to take questions, uh, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Dean. Uh, yeah, sorry, I've got a few. <laughs> um, one thing that came to mind as you were talking was, because uh, I think we've had a conversation around this before, and somewhere in my mind I remember us talking about the fact that other districts don't use their money, and I thought there was going to be a piece of work done about seeing if we could um, claw some back from the ones who didn't do it. So that, that's one part. Um, do we have any data on why some applications don't go, don't go through. You know, it's, what I'm asking is, is it a lot of people and are there other reasons that they're not getting the support? Is there anything we can do to make sure that they do, um, that the applications go through, especially if they need them? And then I'm confused over the section about third party applications. You didn't speak about this, but I read about it when I was reading through the papers. That seemed yeah, well, it was confusing. Yeah, I think that's it for now. <laughs> Just to answer those, in terms of the other districts, we've, we've had these conversations numerous times and there is nothing we can do to compel other districts to offer up any of their underspends. Uh, I think across across Staffordshire there are some districts who probably have greater demand than funding. Uh, we're one of those districts. Uh, there are other districts who have surplus funding. When we've approached this in the past there's been a reluctance and you know I suspect if we were being brutally honest about it we'd we'd always be sort of looking at our protecting our own budget position over others in the first instance, and I, I can understand why people do that. Uh, we have made representation to central government on previous occasions. There was supposed to have been a review of the whole social care funding arrangements a few years back. That didn't happen. Uh, I believe it's still on the cards, but as to when, we don't know. And again, that's largely out of our control. So I think as it stands at the moment, all of our assumptions are based on what we know around the allocations from central government. Uh, they do occasionally come up with a bit of extra cash every now and then for us. I think we had some this year, uh, not significant amounts, because again, it's generally based on a, an apportionment across all areas. Uh, we will always take that money if, if it's on offer because we know we can spend it but i don't think you know i don't think there's much we can do beyond that lobbying uh, approach to really sort of change that and so all of our assumptions are largely based on what we think we're going to get through that allocation process uh, and i think you know to be safe that's probably the better approach to take at the moment because like i say we just don't know just ask you then, are you, are you saying that like if Litchfield had 50,000 and only spent 30, they would keep the 20? They don't have to pay it back because that's what I wondered if it had to go back into a pot. As it stands at the moment, they can use it if, if, if they can actually write a housing assistance policy similar to that that would allow them to use it differently. And, and I believe that some districts have done that previously, so they've actually used it in a different way to fund other things. Uh, 
never, never happened to us. But obviously, you know, we've we've never been in that situation, so not not entirely sure what uh, county would want to do. I think there is a mechanism for clawback if they want to, but again, if it's within a housing assistance policy that they can use it for other mechanisms, then they can use it for other other, other means. And you know, I think if we if we had surplus cash, we may well actually look at stuff like that. You know, and sort of look at. Uh, preventative measures and, and those sorts of things, which I think some districts have have been able to do. Uh, so you know, as it stands at the moment, so far as I'm aware, there's no there's no obligation for them to offer it as a as a shared pool fund. Uh, you know, it would be purely a decision that they would make locally if they wanted to try and offer that as a as a shared pool fund. So I don't think we've got any you know I don't think we've got any hope of sort of say forcing forcing the position, shall we say. Yeah, I don't think there's any risk of us having surplus cash in the immediate future. Not, not in the immediate future. Um, what we did do, if I, just to be helpful, is that this committee did write to the Cabinet um, a little while back, and they, um, they passed a resolution um, that they would write um, in uh, fairly strong terms, quoting the history of the DFG and its allocations. And I... I don't, that, that actually happened as I understand it, is that right? Yeah, um, sorry. sorry that's on. Yeah, I'll, I'll double check on the follow up on that because we were just the last the time uh, I remember sort of reviewing that was to sort of make sure we had the timing right as well as the content because I felt that actually the timing of that going out is actually pretty important given you know the state of you know what's going on nationally and all the rest of it so but i will follow up and come back to you on that one mr weston a couple more points to yep. respond to so in, in terms of the uh, fallout rates i can't tell you what they are at this moment in time but yes we do capture that data and um, there are a whole range of reasons uh clearly you know people people pass away you know, whilst waiting for grants, so that does that does happen. Uh, people change their mind about what they want. They perhaps go and move with relatives or move somewhere else. Uh, they may move out of district or go into care. There are people who will effectively fall out once the test of resources is done and their contribution is calculated as being excessive or in excess of the, the value of the works so you know th there are various reasons they will be captured and uh, they'll be captured across sort of the various uh, the various reasons for, for that and I think I think in fact we have to report on that so it's you know yes we do capture it but I couldn't tell you what they were offhand or what the numbers were uh, but you know like I say it's it, it is something that we know happens and like I say I think test of resources has historically been a bit of an issue for us uh, um, I think my worry was that people might fall out of it because they need support with the application and I just wanted to make sure that we were doing all that we could to make sure that people can process it if they need that support. People, whilst, whilst applicants can make a direct application to us, the service is set up largely to support through the process end to end so some people may choose to come to us with a direct application some people feel that's a quicker way of doing it because they do all the work themselves uh, and, and submit a you know a completed application to us and they manage the works themselves that's a perfectly acceptable route to take if you want to take that the vast majority don't the vast majority will actually sort of come to us and we manage that service end to end and the service is set up in that way for us which is why one of those uh, grant pots in areas around professional fees and side which effectively covers people if they get to a point where they go through all of that and then still don't proceed uh, so for the most part people will support be supported end to end so that probably isn't a, a significant issue for people and then the third party one uh, just looking at sort of the process on that one uh, I think that's largely where someone else is making an application on behalf of the applicant yeah, yeah I, there's it won't always be the grant applicant if you like who makes the application or the, sorry the recipient of the works or the person who benefits from the works isn't always necessarily the grant applicant and again we've got a couple of those on at the moment where uh, it's uh, a parent and it's children 
making that application on behalf of parents and it's sort of it it does complicate matters slightly because of where who you're assessing and how you're assessing them uh, so it sets it out through that process uh, so you know that that's largely where that third party application is going to come through and like i say the other one that we sort of will get is around uh, social housing providers because again some some social housing providers have their own preferred approach to delivering adaptations but they still want us to pay for them because that's the way the statutory grants are set up you've jugged my memory now about the bit that was worrying me um if it's parents on behalf of a child then yes it will be the parents house i think the thing that worried me was if it's a, a child a grown-up child trying to help out mom or dad in putting an application together it sounded as if they were going to be means tested and were responsible which i thought was a bit weird that would depend on who owns the property and where, where the works are being done yeah, I, mean, I think that, 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 that's essentially, if it, if it was a case of parent living in their own home and child assisting them through the process in their own home, then the, the, the homeowner would still be the applicant and the recipient of the works would still be the applicant. What we do sometimes get is where the, the uh, parent is living with, with the children and then it becomes who is the applicant and how does that work? It also because it covers, it, and it also covers things like, what are the tenancy arrangements? Because if there's no formal tenancy agreements in place, that creates potential risks that someone could have the work done and then kick the kick the family member out immediately without any sort of recourse because there's no tenancy agreements. So it's really to sort of try and protect those sorts of situations. I I'm, I wouldn't say it, it's a frequent occurrence, but I suppose it's probably something that's happened frequently enough across the country that it's worth capturing somewhere just to make sure we protect ourselves. Because the last thing we want to do is go in, adapt a property, and then all of a sudden they go, all right, you can go now, Dad, you know, off you go. We've got a nice new ground floor living, you know, bedroom and kitchen area or wherever else, you know. So it's to protect those sorts of situations. Yeah, you can see certain safeguarding implications in some circumstances, can't you? Any other any other questions on that? Councillor Maycock. Yeah, I think it's a really good policy. It's really thorough. Um, it's just a couple of things. Uh, if we're looking at the DFG overview, say if I, hypothetically, um, come to you with, and I've got an Oki health assessment done and I needed some adaptations doing, how long from today would it take to go through the process? So there's a statutory process that we have to go through on that. Uh, offhand, I can't remember all the details, but I think it's we have to approve within six months and it has to be funded within a further six months. So effectively, end to end, that's a twelve-month process on that. So, if if somebody needed adaptations to live safely in their property, the council's got twelve months to deal with it. Essentially, that's the statutory time period on it. The the, the issue we have is we because of the the waiting list we hold and the funding available. We do have a waiting list, which means we are tackling them in date order. Uh, so th there is always going to be a time from when a, an initial inquiry comes in through to an occupational uh, occupational sort of therapy referral through to a grant application. No, no, uh, what I'm saying is I've already had the, the Occy help it, in the policy. It just says professional occupational therapist. If I'm coming to you with an occupational assessment completed by a professional, how long will it take from it there? Depends on, it depends on whether you're doing your own grant application. Yeah. Because if you're doing your own grant application, then we've got six months to approve that and then a further six months to pay it. If we're, pro if we're pro managing the process of it, then th that's where it slots into our programme for you know, potentially for a bit of a waiting list for us to actually manage that process. So it, you know, it, it is that question of if you're managing it yourself, so you are effectively coming to us with a fully formed application, 
then we have, I believe it's six months to approve that application. And six months to then And then pay. a further six months, then we can defer it by further six months for payment. So that's 12 months. Potentially. So, but, but if, if so that, that's if the application's completed and we're coming to you with a completed yeah. application, but, yeah. if, if, but if the council's doing the management, how, how long is that then? That, at the moment, I don't have the exact details on that. I can get that for you. Uh, but it, it, there is a waiting time for us to actually do that. It's uh, going to be initial, longer than 12 months, Yeah, so it's it? for that initial process on our side as well to do that. Would it be longer than 12 months? Not necessarily because we've got that further six months is for the payment of the grant. Now, if we're managing it ourselves, clearly we, we would also be managing the contractor side of it. So we'd be paying the contractor direct. We wouldn't be releasing the grant to the individual. Would more manpower or ma it, it, it person power in house <laughs> reduce that, that time scale? No. The issue, no, well, I say no. With the current funding resources, no, because all we'd all that would happen is we'd spend our money more quickly because we'd have a greater staffing resource. So we'd run out of funding for the project more quickly, which then means you don't have the ability to carry on doing more assessments and management. So to to effectively speed things up and put more resource into it, you'd have to put both resource into the people on the ground to do the management side of it but then at the other end of it you'd have to put additional funding in to do the work <coughs> otherwise you just run out of money more quickly so, so the staffing costs have to come out of the, the, the 30 the 30 000 the pounds. staffing costs are part of the overall capital project yes so now 18 months ago i had to go through dfg with my mum but it was north warwickshire and it took about three months and i thought that was shocking now we're talking about 12 months here. That's sickening. Sorry, but it, but it is. Do you mind if I just interject? It'd be interesting because I, I think, Paul, you're talking about the sort of the, 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 the sort of the rules around how long it, so sort of the maximum amount of time it would take, wouldn't it? Would it be helpful to actually have what has been the historic sort of figures, previous figures in terms of what would be the average waiting times, what has been basically? Would that be helpful? I mean, I, I think that would that would to a certain extent be helpful. What I'd quite like to know is what the risk assessment is um, for people who are getting that grant and, and how vulnerable they actually are. And is a 12-month waiting period reasonable for somebody who's very vulnerable? I think that's the question. Councillor Claymore. You've just described my question very clearly, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, that was my question. Um, you know, we may have people here who you know, need immediate intervention. Um, and I know occupational health are very good at doing what they can do. But to think that somebody may have to wait six, well, six months at least, we're talking, is just, well, it just beggars belief to me. You know, what are we expecting these people to do? Are we expecting them to crawl on the floor to get to the bathroom? What are we expecting them to do? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we can only deliver within the resource we've got, uh, both sort of people on the ground to do the work and also the resource to actually fund the works once we've made that assessment. So, as I said, if we want to speed things up, yes, we could speed the assessment process up, but then we spend the money more quickly on doing the assessments and don't have anything left then to do the works. We could we could extend times and do more work and have fewer people on the ground but things take longer or we put more money into both ends of it and you do the have more people on the ground to do the assessments more quickly and have the money to do the works once you've got those assessments but that does require that funding resource to do it uh, i think you know within the existing resource we've got the the, the team is set up to deliver the level of budget we've got within the resource we've got over uh, over that stated period of time with the best use of resource that we have available to us without over i suppose overdoing the staffing side of stuff at the expense of the actual delivery of works and i think you know that that's the risk you take is that if if we spend too much if we spend too much of our money on staffing 
then we just don't do the works so then really where's the benefit you know the benefit sort of lost again isn't it in terms of you don't actually deliver anything other than an assessment that says yeah we need to do something but now we can't afford to do it uh so i think that that's that's where it'd have to come from if in that sense it would have to be more of a funding issue than anything right but you can you can hear the concern around the committee councillor claymore i'll come to you now. Can I suggest that we come up with some recommendation that this goes back again and um, it's looked at again from the point of view of the financing and how we're spending it and how we can have efficiencies on it <laughs> so that we speed up the process. I mean, I, for one, am not happy to go along with the recommendations as they stand, but that might just be my opinion. Well, we'll put it to the members very shortly. Councillor Maycock. If somebody's uh, discharged from, from hospital and the Oki Health at the hospital have said that they need these adaptations at, at the home, <clears throat> the council's yet, yeah, yeah, we'll go for a DFG with them. They go into the home, they're waiting on a stair lift and they fall down the stairs. Who's liability? Where's the liability lie there? The liability would lie with discharge, I would have thought. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the home isn't safe for someone to go to, then they probably shouldn't be going to the home uh, until it's until it's been adapted. That would be my understanding of it. Again, I'd have to check on that one. Uh, on the flip side of that, if somebody's in their home and they've got an Oki Health assessment completed, done by a professional, saying they need these adaptations to make it safe for them, they've put an application form in, something happens, who, who's the liability there? Again, as far as I understand it, we wouldn't be liable for not adapting the property. Our liability is to adapt within the timeframes of the statute. So as a per we're, we don't have that health and safety responsibility for the individual at that point. Slightly different potentially on our own properties uh, because I think we have slightly different obligations to our tenants. Uh, but in terms of private, private home ownership, it's not. Our, our obligation is to fund grants so we we don't sort of do that i suppose the the health and safety risk assessment for that individual isn't our health and safety risk assessment it's an occupational therapy assessment that says this is this is what the adaptation is we then fund it because arguably the same would occur is if a person wasn't even eligible for a grant where does the liability lie well it can't lie with us if we're not if we're not actually even providing a grant to that person so we don't we don't carry that level of responsibility under the act uh, and also bear in mind we aren't the responsible provider under the care act that that's that's county council is responsible under the care act they are also responsible for pro providing certain pieces of equipment and they would also provide care packages for people so it may well be that that person has to have an extended care package until such time that an adaptation is done uh, again, that's one of the arguments that have been put to County Council a number of times around funding that, you know, potentially the benefit of increasing funding to adaptations has a complementary effect elsewhere in reducing things like care packages, hospital times and things like that. But that that's not something that's ever come through to us. It, it, you said about the, the six months to, to, to complete the assessment. Is that in statute? The way the legislation is set up, I believe it's six months to actually approve a grant application. And if, if we lapse on that, what's how, what's the customer's redress? How do they go about that? Technically, they can take us to court. It's, okay. it's yeah, I mean, ultimately, that, that would be the route. It would be, they would, they would take it through the legal process to, to challenge it. Councillor Daniels. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to remark on, you know, the care and concern that we're hearing around the room and some really tragic cases that have affected people here. And I don't mean to disagree with Councillor Claymore, but when so many things come back to funding that comes from central government, be it coming down to our level, coming down to Staffordshire County Council level, until things change in this next general election year, things are not going to change funding wise. And so whether we scrutinise this or ask about efficiencies until more money comes from a government that actually cares, things aren't going to change. Thank you. Councillor Claymore. You said that there's a waiting list. So are we, 
what you're saying is there are people that have waited more than six months for their application to be approved or not go through? I couldn't answer you that at this moment. I mean, like I say, I haven't got that information. This was purely about the policy at this stage. It's something I can certainly get. We'll have all that information. I just have what I haven't got it here because, like I say, it was really just bringing the policy forward. I do think it'd be useful to have that information and see what the backlog is, please. I think it would also be useful to have the information about what support is available for the waiting period that people are waiting for these adaptations and what is there for them. Councillor Smith. Yeah, I was going <clears> to <throat> I was going to sort of slightly summarise what what's already been mentioned. So um, so essentially, we need waiting figures for for the last year. I would I would suggest. Um, both on the approval and the, the actual works. Um, one that I thought was mentioned, but might I think for me, I'm personally interested, would be the sort of priority. So for example, you know, if someone literally has had an accident and they, and they need adapt, adaptations, you know, quickly, promptly, you know, what sort of, how is that, how is that taken care of? Because to me, that would, you know, potentially mean you're at the top of the queue, for example um so so information on that and um yeah possible increase in financial resources within it because essentially what what's been said is there's a certain amount of limitation at the moment through through the financial um so yeah so come back on for us to come back on that yeah i could probably address one of those at them as it stands priority wise it's done on date order uh at the moment what we used to have when County Council many years ago operated the Occupational Therapy Service, they used to do priorities. But what we found is that people moved up and down those priorities based on how much pressure they put on the occupational therapist. So you'd, people would be a, a category three priority uh, and suddenly they'd jump to a priority one without any real sort of change in their need other than the fact they'd probably been constantly contacting the occupational therapist. Uh, and it's very difficult to actually put categorising one person against another uh, because if they've got a need, they've got a need. And, you know, if there's an assessed need for an adaptation, there's an assessed need for an adaptation. And it's very difficult for an occupational therapist, particularly one who hasn't seen every single person, because it will be different occupational therapists seeing different people, to prioritise one against another, and that, that, and I think that's always going to be a complexity in there. Councillor Maycock. So, so at the minute, the, the, there's no um, prioritisation, is what is what you're saying the, through that, what that. date order. But if this policy goes through, there will be prioritisation, won't there? So much as possible, but again, always recognising. Difficult to prioritise people sort of accurately because. But for but for an occupational health professional, it isn't though, is it? Well, what they'll do is they'll put a priority to what they think. But then, when you've got five priority ones, which one is a higher priority out of five priority ones? So there, there will always be an element of yes, you could sort of say that there's a certain category of requirement, but there comes a point where. How do you prioritise within those priorities? And I think that, like I say, that was something we were seeing constantly with occupational therapists before, where that they prioritise based on partly on people sort of pressurising them, but also when when they've got five priority ones, which one of those five five actually comes first? So th there's always got to be that element of data order in there. I mean, I'm struggling a bit now because what you've just explained is that there's a section in this policy that that might not happen. At the moment, it, we are at the moment we are on just date order purely. But but I said if if this policy goes through at point twelve, there is prioritisation. So far as possible, and I think that there's got to be a recognition in there that you can only prioritise to a certain point, and once you've got someone who's say a priority one. It's difficult then to sort of prioritise all of those priority ones and sort of say, well, which one's a priority one A and one B and one C and one D. So I think, you know, yes, you can prioritise to a certain degree, but you will never prioritise an absolute list, if you like, and there will always be new people coming into that list at any given time. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I 
Um, what I have to say is that the um, the opinion of an occupational therapist about the condition that somebody has is more likely to be sensitive to their risk than the date order is. The date order is, is entirely arbitrary and there is no element of judgment in a date order. It is simply something that happens. Councillor Dean. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of points again. I mean, the, the priority thing just seems absolute madness because it is that issue, the, the, the scope between the, the different projects that will be coming in must be huge. And for some people, it's about quality of life at that moment. You know, we could make a real difference if it was given the priority, whereas some applications that come in might not quite be so life and death. Um, also, the, the, <laughs> the part about spreading out the money and not wanting to use it all up in one go, I can understand that to some point, but I would rather the work got done sooner rather than later. And then if the waiting list has to start again the next year, so be it, although I would rather there wasn't a waiting list. Because at the end of the day, prevention is cheaper than cure. And what we're doing, we, you know, people need those things in the house to keep them safe. And we're, we're just opening them up to not being able to have any quality of life and maybe being at risk. Yes, I, I, I do keep coming back to uh, Councillor Claymore's view about what are they supposed to do in the meantime. I do, I do keep coming back to that. When somebody is in hospital, particularly an older person, they lose 10% of muscle mass a day. And that makes them much more liable to fall when they come out. And without the adaptations, I think that seems like an almost inevitable consequence. So some element of risk assessment has to be done in that sort of circumstance, surely. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as I say, as it stands at the moment, it's date priority because that's what we've got. I think the policy, is, as, you know, as Councillor Maycock says, does introduce an element of prioritisation, but I think, again, recognising that there will be limitations to that, uh, at, you know, because there is a strong risk that everyone suddenly becomes an urgent priority. Uh, you know, and I'll give you perhaps they are, uh, you know, that th that may well be the case. So, you know, yes, there is that element in there. And I think, you know, it does what it does set out is some of the, I suppose, where those priorities sit around things like immediate risk to people. Uh, so, you know, th there is a, there is some consideration given to that in the policy. In terms of the timing, yes, we could accelerate everything and deliver it. But I suppose where the risk in that comes is I having the resource to deliver that. So not just internal resource, but also contracting resource because we're using a limited pool of supply chain, people like lift suppliers, hoist suppliers, contractors. But again, what it does do is it just pushes your waiting list all to the other end. So if we spent all of our money in the first three months of the year, we could sit around for the next nine months twiddling our thumbs, getting ready for the next batch of works, but all you've done is created a nine-month waiting list for everything after that. So it's... But the people who weren't going to get in that tranche of money are going to have to wait that amount of time anyway. We're just making some people wait. But, but I, suppose where, I suppose where I'm coming from with it is it requires additional resource to do that. So straight away, you've potentially spent a chunk of that money that could have gone on to an adaptation. Even if it's only one adaptation, you've spent a chunk of money on resourcing up to get to a point where you've done all your assessments, done all of the the, the pre-work for it. So all of the, I suppose, the non the non delivery work, and you've now lost the opportunity to do perhaps another level access shower at the end of it because you've spent your money on staffing costs and administrative costs. So it's that, and that's, that's, I suppose, for my mind, that's where the balance comes is that, you know, there is a risk there that you throw all, you throw more money into, the front end resource, but that doesn't actually deliver an adaptation at the end of it, and you've spent that money on, I suppose, non-productive, in terms of the grant applicants, non-productive work. You know, it's I, it, there is that balance there. Yeah, I was just going to say, just sort of move this along a, a little bit because I mean, essentially, it's going to cabinet. Um, yeah, I mean the new. 
the 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 new the report basically says um that under this new policy there would be a, a standard and urgent criteria i suppose but what we're basically saying is and correct me if i'm wrong is that needs to be beefed up a little bit there needs to be a little bit more focus on that so yeah i'm just um that's on second near the end i think it is for the report page four so yeah if if there's anything specific that i think you know if anyone's got any ideas let us know or if not we'll just pursue it offline yeah we've just had a a conversation here and um, this this needs to go there are still obviously considerable concerns around the room and I think a, a, a reluctance to simply sign off today is what I'm reading. Uh, we have just called an extra meeting for the 4th of March. And I think this is not going to Cabinet until after that date. So I wonder if it's worth coming back to the 4th of March meeting with this, with some greater clarity about what do people do in the meantime. <laughs> Um, and um, to see how much flexibility there is in the way this policy is being applied. Any thoughts about that? I suppose just for, for purposes of clarity, I think it's what we need to say is that at the moment we are currently operating under just a statutory process and this is a new process that would come in to replace the current process. So they are two different pieces of processes that we'd be working to. So it's really, it's, I suppose, it's not looking so much at how we do it now because that isn't what we're doing. This is more about looking at what the policy would do and how the policy would change it. So I think, you know, it's just, I suppose it's really getting that clarity around. It's, it's, it's all well and good looking at historic waiting lists and current waiting lists and backlogs. It's what does the new policy achieve around that and the, the costs around that. So, yeah. So in terms of mandatory stuff, which is what you're just doing now, how does this new policy reduce the waiting times that people are having? Or, or does it? Yeah. Because if you've just said... That it, it, doesn't it doesn't necessarily reduce waiting times. Obviously, the priority, the prioritisation may have some impact for some people. Uh, it may also have a negative impact for some people because if we're prioritising one job over another, then potentially someone moves up the list with a finite budget, someone moves down the list. And, you know, that that's a reality that we have to face with it is that we're operating within a finite pot of money. Uh, and if we suddenly get an influx of priority jobs uh, for hospital releases, for example, then the potential is that, yes, yeah, some people then move down the list further because we can't, we simply can't afford to fund the works of those properties. So I, I couldn't say to you that this policy would speed up the process for everyone because I don't think it will. What it, what it does potentially do is give you a, a greater control over the priorities and you know risk assessment and need. But bear in mind, of course, that anyone who is eligible for an adaptation and who's been assessed as being eligible for adaptation has a need because Otherwise, they wouldn't be eligible for an adaptation. You know, they, the, the the whole process of the, the the DFGs and the grant applications is it has to be a proven assessed need. So if they haven't got an approval assessed need, they're going to get kicked out straight away and said, "Very sorry, you're not eligible." So everyone who's who's sort of eligible has a need somewhere that needs to be met, uh, but within that finite pot of money. Right, I feel like we're starting to go around in circles a little bit here. Um, now, I'm not... So, Councillor Claymore. Yeah, just to say that I'm happy with um, bringing this back on the 4th of March, if that's the consensus. Can I have that moved and seconded, please? Who's prepared to move? Thank you. I'm Councillor Maycock, second. All those in favour? So can I ask you to come back with this on the 4th of March with gr greater clarity about what new arrangements will mean for individuals, particularly during the waiting period, as far as I'm concerned, because that's the bit that the assurance that I'm looking for is that people will be kept safe during that waiting period. 
yeah, I mean, if that's the key consideration you want us to look at, then yeah, clearly I can I can ask that question. Councillor Claymore. Yeah, I, I, I do think that's one of the points, but I think we need to look at the prioritisation and how that's going to be dealt with because I think at the moment it's very as much as possible. So you know, we need it clarifying a bit more. I think. Thank you. Politics is the language of priorities, Councillor. I mean, I know it's not your report, but there's some numbers in here that that have scared me, quite frankly. In quarter three, there's been no completed cases for a DFG. Yeah, as I say, I, I don't have all the details in front of me on that one because that wasn't sort of part of the report I was looking to bring forward to this meeting. Happy, you know, I think if, if that's stuff that people want to discuss, then I think, you know, it's probably worth someone from the disabled adaptations team coming coming to a meeting specifically to discuss those. And I'm sort of more than happy if, 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 if this committee wants to propose uh, a, a format of report that they'd like to see on that, then I'm sure we can bring something forward to that. Uh, but that would be reporting on performance as opposed to, you know, looking at a policy. policy. We have had it proposed, seconded and voted in favour of returning on the 4th of March to this. Everybody content with that? Can I just check this out again? Information around the prioritisation. Yep. Uh, yeah. So we'll be deferring consideration of the recommendations to that date as well. Okay. Can I uh, can I thank you um, for that? Well, I know that wasn't an easy session, but can I thank you for that um, and for coming along and being so uh, candid with us? It's been helpful. Thank you. Moving on to housing strategy quarterly updates to December 2023. Um, and I think it's you, Councillor Smith, again, introducing this. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so, I mean, it's basically the quarterly update that we're all familiar with now. So um, I'll, I'll, pass, I'll pass it on. But one thing I was going to say, actually, is I think it was brought up in the last one which was um, the high numbers in Glasgow. Um, so, yeah, basically, I don't know why I didn't think it at the time, but, yeah, essentially, because you've got the outreach session um, provided at the Sacred um, Heart Centre, and that's once a week, I believe it is. Um, so that might be... So, so people are obviously accessing that outreach service in Glasgow, so that probably skews the numbers. That's all I was going to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I'll let uh, Lisa actually pull together most of the quarter this, uh, you know, this quarter. Uh, so I'll let Lisa bring bring that to you. And obviously, as you know, uh, Councillor Bain, um, you know, the, the report from the housing strategy is across a number of services. We do have to pull the data from a lot of the services. So questions will gladly take back to the individual departments if there are any arising from the report. OK, thank you. So I'll hand over to Lisa. Thank you. So I will just go through the highlights of each section for you rather than the whole thing, which you will have seen before. So um, if we go to the first section around first homes, we've got two properties now approved at the two gates and the Dostill site. And we've also got a further set of homes, been seven mixed property types on the Coton Lane estate as well that are coming through. If we then move down, um, the council have been successful in receiving a grant funding from the Container Outback Management Fund for 13 projects to 13 projects to promote healthier housing and address health inequalities. And some of those projects are, are addressed later in this report. 
in relation to fuel poverty, I think at the last update we did have beat the cold here. Um, there's some figures there around beat the cold and the work that they've undertaken over that period. Um, previously there have been appendix, but I've just, just dropped those into the report. Um, beat the cold did actually bid for a grant of £10,500 which they have actually declined due to a staffing issue. Um, that, that money has now been split amongst other voluntary sectors in order to deliver upon that, also to reduce the cost of living in these difficult times. CHS, Community Home Solutions, are currently contracted to assist with the HUG project at the moment, and we're currently doing some marketing to get people <coughs> to use that initiative to make their homes more fuel efficient. And the comp granting um, that we have been also successful on is going to provide a temporary post of an empty homes officer. Um, of interest is the fact that we have approximately 400 people on our housing rating register and we have approximately 400 empty properties in the town. Um, so we're doing some work to access some of those properties to get them back into circulation, which will then take the pressure off our housing register as well. Um, the advert for that is about to go out, so hopefully we will be recruiting very shortly for that position. It's initially a seven-month contract. Um, obviously, it may be a little more or a little less, depending on the salaries and fees around that post. Um, in relation to the houses of multi-occupation, we've currently got 93. Just an update there, 65 active, active licences and 28 that do not require to be licensed but do have to comply with certain legislation. The damp and mould figures for our private team are there and as you can see, the service requests have gone up in quarter three. That's seasonal, um, hence they did drop before that, but they have gone up. That's not to say that all of those properties have been prohibited. Um, some have required action. A lot of them have had advice and referrals around them. Um, there's a case study in there about an elderly couple who were in their own property. Um, and we have discussed them before around, they had a prohibition notice, property had extreme damp and mould. We six picked them up under our housing register and we have rehomed them into a sheltered scheme since, which has brought a number of benefits around their health, but also around the, the household income for the family, because obviously sheltered housing is substantially cheaper than private rent, and they've had a reduction in their utility bills. The number of HMOs expected um, increased in November. That's decreased in December purely just to staffing levels over that period. And there's some figures there around the enforcements that have been taking place. Um, the figures below at the top of page 18, they are the our council housing repairs figures. So there's actually 100 jobs that have gone through in that period and a breakdown of those there. Eco4, we've had four applications, all four of which were approved. The Great British Insulation Scheme, we've currently had 64 inquiries. That relates to a publicity and marketing of those at the end of December. So we've had a great take up on that, which is excellent. There we go. Some further, there's some appendices attached that do refer to the, the information there around TAC, homelessness and the rough sleeping. Um, then we come on to the facilities for the DSA and the DFG, which Paul was talking about earlier. I mean, obviously, what we can read into that is whilst we've got some completed cases at zero, that might not mean that works haven't been done. It might mean works have been done, but they may not have been paid for, or they may have been grant approved and works is underway. So completed cases as a zero means whole process start to finish. I'd imagine that, that the final quarter will read very differently to that. The lower part of that, you'll read in December, the team approved its first grants, so those will start to be completed shortly. There's some information on hospital to home and sheltered housing there. An update on the comp 
funding that is also supporting cooking lessons, a compostable toilet um, at the allotment gardens in Belgrave. And in addition, there's a mobile unit for Active Tamworth Project to be based at Anchor Valley, which goes to supporting healthy eating, signposting activities for young people, adults and their families. Happy to take any questions. If it doesn't relate to us directly, I'm afraid I will have to feed it back to the provider, but happy to do that and to come back to you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Daniels. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for that really comprehensive report. There's so much detail in this. And um, it's particularly nice to get that positive reading at the end of it. There's a mention of certain projects that are going on and the successes. So in the midst of lots of the really heavy stuff we have to cover, it was nice to read. Sorry to be ignorant. Um, and item two, um, looking at kind of when some of the projects are completed, it described a council house job awaiting payment approval. Um, what does that mean, sorry? Struggling to reach. Um, there is a period between invoicing and the actual payment cycle, and that would depend on the contractor that goes out as well. So it's the gap between the two. Councillor Dean. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was at a meeting where you gave this case study and the oh, outcome cool. of it, you know, the, the issue, absolutely heartbreaking, but the outcome is fabulous and it's good that we were able to do that. Um, my point, it's not a question because I have already raised it with um, Rob Barnes, the um, tackling empty homes. Um, I live with a council house either side of me that has been empty in the last year and it has taken months for each one to be um, put back into use. I, I have a real problem with this. I, don't, I mean, the first time was at the end of last year and it just seemed, you know, that it went on forever and ever. But then it happened again with the house the other side and the people still aren't in there and the, the guy moved in the summer. And I'm not quite sure why these things are taking so long. Do we need to review the whole system? But, you know, you quoted the amount of people who are waiting for homes. This, to me, is, is something that we really need to get better at. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Um, void turnaround is obviously looks picked up between the housing team and the repair contract. Yeah. That sits under Paul, so I'll feed that back to them and I'll pass that response on to you, OK? Any other, any other questions on that? The recommendation is that the committee consider and endorse the report as presented. Is anyone prepared to move? Yep, Councillor Maycock, second. Councillor Claymore, all those in favour? I did have an issue I wanted to discuss with the committee about the quarterly update and to consider whether that remains an appropriate time frame for considering this report. It does take a huge amount of officer time. We have had that discussion. And it does put a lot of strain on the officers. Um, so I was wondering whether it might be more appropriate for this committee to look at this report on an annual basis rather than a quarterly basis. If there are individual casework items, they can be picked up in between times but I'm wondering whether the amount of work that goes into this is reflected in the added value that it brings. I do wonder that. So I, I thought I'd ask the question of committee here today. I think if we did that, I would just like it to be um, confirmed that if there are any areas of concern, they will come to us straight away and it'll be, it'll be raised so that we can look at it so that things don't get left for that amount of time. Yeah, I think considering it in, in by exception is probably the right way to set about uh, Councillor Maycock. Yeah, I mean, each quarter this, this report's got better and I totally understand the amount of work that goes into it. But maybe seeing it in six months in a 12-month format. So, ha, ha, so it, months. yeah, so, so, so then we can we can see how the report would look in a 12 month mm -hmm. picture then, but to come back in six months. Yep. So that's, uh, 
Yeah, please. Yep. It's been seconded. So it's to come back. Yeah. So can I, is, is that six months from now, or do you want that sort of June and June and December, or...? Six months from, from now, now. Yeah, so mid June. Yeah, that'd be, yeah, and as I say, if there are other things, you know, you've obviously picked up on the, the DFGs today, the disabled, and, and you know there's the, the, you know, the other, some of the issues were out, some of the private sector housing and the regulations, so absolutely guarantee if there are things by exception, more than happy to bring um, those items to you. I'm just thinking if we have that as a July report, the quarter would finish in June, so that would be absolutely up to date July. if we bought it in July for the previous 12 months. Sounds ideal. So can I thank you for coming along? Um, if you want to stay, you are, of course, more than welcome. Councillor Smith, your, <laughs> your endurance has been heroic, so thank you for staying. <laughs> but if you need to leave, that's fine. Thank you very much for coming along and being so helpful. Item 10 is the forward plan. Is there anything we want to add or comment on in the forward plan? Nothing. Moving on. Uh, working group updates. We currently have no working groups, so there are no updates, quite logically. Um, the health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan, and we've already indicated there will be an additional meeting on the 4th of March to consider both the sheltered housing community alarm and the previous discussion we had. So anything else that people want to add in? I've got one item that I, I think I... I probably would like to add in, but has anybody got anything else? I'd quite like to add in um, pharmacy and the provision of pharmacy and medications, particularly out of hours, because we've had a, we had an example yesterday. We've had a few examples recently, um, where that seems to be causing some concern to people in Tamworth. So I would like us to add that to our work plan so that we can call in the um, pharmaceutical needs assessment and consider it. Councillor Dean. You, that has just jogged my memory in that there is a piece of work going on around dentists, isn't there? And which would seem detrimental to our people. I just wondered if, there, if we could find out some information about dentistry in Tamworth as well and the viability of um, NHS places. Yeah, I mean, the, the commissioning of um, NHS dentistry is now with the integrated care system. It's been delegated down from region. I think that's brought with it some challenges in terms of the changes in commissioning arrangements. And there has been a loss of NHS dentistry right across the country. There are now what's been called dental deserts in various places. And an indication from some people that the waiting list for NHS dentistry in some areas will be nine years. And Nuffield Trust has said that it will disappear entirely. So there are, there are some issues about NHS dentistry. Um, so I think it's a good idea to add it to our work plan and at least call in the integrated care system to say what are the commissioning arrangements for Tamworth, please. And if they can't tell us, well, we will all be disappointed, won't we? Right, looking at the work plan, um, there was a decision taken on the George Bryan Centre um, by the Integrated Care Board, and I'll, I'll just um, tell you what it was. I, th I think I've already mentioned what it was. 
um, the board, which is the Integrated Care Board, voted and approved the recommendation within the decision-making business case, namely to make permanent the existing temporary service change, which is com uh, community provision within Turnworth, and maintain inpatient mental health services at St George's Hospital in Stafford. So I think that is the end of, of the George Bryan Centre um, for all practical purposes. And what we've agreed before as a committee that we will call them in to say, what are the arrangements for Tamworth? What is the alternative provision? And how long is it going to last? Is another one. Councillor Claymore. Yeah, I'd just like it on record to say how disappointed I am with that result. Um, I know Councillor Maycock has done a lot towards trying to convince the ICB that this isn't a, a good idea, but they've made the decision. I think we knew what the decision would be because there was only ever one option. There were never two options, there was only ever one. Um, I'd just like it on record how disappointed I am. I think the committee shares your disappointment. In fact, I'm, I'm quite angry about the decision, but it has been made. And we are, I think we knew it would happen when they didn't repair it after the fire, when they made the decision not to put in place repairs and to clear up smoke damage. I think we were all fairly clear what was going to happen, but it's still very disappointing. What I want to know now is, are they going to keep the people of Tamworth safe? Yeah, just to come back on that, was there, in the report, um, the most recent report, was there any mention of what happened to the insurance money? Well, there's a question. I don't know. Um, Councillor Maycock. I'm not saying Councillor Maycock's <laughs> going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Him about pocket. No, I, I have, I did ask that quite a few times. There were answers given. Um, I can't remember the exact figures um, but basically apparently NHS buildings aren't insured for what they're worth I think that's the, that's the short of it and the money that the insurance that was gained from it was put into community services that have been uplifted so i.e. The, the, the crisis calf at Mm -hmm. at uh, Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. uh, other initiatives that they've got going on. Um, but apparently it's not, it, it, they can't use the insurance money for capital, it's just service deliverer. So they can't build a new building, but they can give you different services. That's what, that's, don't shoot the messenger. Councillor <laughs> <laughs> Seville. Thank you for that, Councillor Maycock. Um, is there any update on Cherry Orchard? So I've not heard anything about that in months and months. Councillor Maycock. It should be opening soon. Uh, the construction work seems to be near, nearing completion. Um, it was meant to open March, last March. Um, they might have got the, the last two di digits wrong on the year. But it looks like it's nearly there. Thank you. I'll just bring these points up so that anybody who's watching will understand yeah. what's yeah. going on. So forgive me for asking a lot of questions. No, the, the questions are exactly what we need. People need to understand that we are looking at these issues. Councillor Maycock, are you, are you waving at me again? Yeah. You are, all right. Uh, like Councillor Hangel said, the, the decision was made before mm -hmm. it certainly come across my desk. Uh, before I was even a councillor, I guess the decision was made. Um, some of the things that I was bringing up was about the transport to and from Stafford. So I think it's worth the committee, uh, via self chair, keeping an eye on the SOP that they wrote yeah. and see if it's being utilised effectively, if at all, um, and how they're using the data streaming service that they said they were going to use with iPads and stuff. Because I just, I just want to make sure that this stuff that they said they were going to implement has been implemented. Because some of the transport arrangements, my understanding is, um, that have been put in place are time limited. 
and I worry about what happens after that time and what happens to people in Tamworth. And that is one of the questions we will ask when they come in. And we're going to keep at them until they do come in because we need to understand. Yeah, so I'm going to put that on the work plan as well. I mean, it's too late to get the ICB in because yeah. the decision's been made. So we now need to get the provider in to try and understand, not the commissioner. Yep, that's that's all good. Um, we can take, I think, uh, the George Bryan yeah. Centre off the work plan yeah. and put in the alternative arrangements from MPFT yeah. and what they're going to be doing. Is everybody happy with that? Well, happy is probably not the right word, is it, really? Content, no, not content either. Um, everybody accepting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is there any other business? I know it's not on the agenda, but I always ask it. Anything else? In that case, can I thank everybody for their attendance and their contribution? And I'll see you next time around on the 4th of March. Many thanks. <laughs>